This is Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you are welcome. (laughs) (laughs) You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback, and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind-the-scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. Be sure to check out my weekly podcast, You're Welcome with Michael Malice, now on Podcast One. You might know me from my terrible Twitter, my horrible books, or the nonsense I spout on podcasts like Rogan and Glenn Beck. It's all there. Are you black-pilled or white-pilled for the future of the UK? What is a man? <laughs> what is a man? What is a no? I, what is the, I, are you white pilled or black pilled? No seriousness, girl. No, 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 I love the Jesse Lee piece of question. <laughs> the fact that you discovered that gives me hope for some of the things that I've still got well, that are missing. Well, if you need James G. Blaine's autograph, you are welcome to it. Of course, being the co author of How to Have Impossible Conversations makes you the perfect guest for this train wreck of a show. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> new episodes are available every Thursday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, and wherever you get your podcasts. You are welcome. After her newspaper column, Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone created a media firestorm, Lenore Skenazy got the nickname America's Worst Mom. Nice. She went on to write Free Range Kids, the book turned to movement. Lenore has lectured everywhere from DreamWorks to Microsoft headquarters to schools across America, and let's not forget the Bulgarian Happiness Festival. On TV, you may have seen her on The Today Show, The Daily Show, or her own reality show, World's Worst Mom. Now Lenore is co-founder and president of Let Grow, the national nonprofit promoting childhood independence. Lenore is just the best. I loved speaking with her, especially about to become a mom. This was just such a fun conversation, and I appreciate her so much in the world. I'm with Lenore Skenazy, everybody. Welcome to Walk Ends Welcome. Oh, are, are you saying that to everybody or to me? It's, everybody gets confused and I like, kind of like it now. Where they're uh-huh. like, are we talking to everyone or me? Hello, I'm like, everyone, everyone and you. <laughs> I guess I'm part of the masses. Hello. How are you today? Oh, um, fine. How about how about in this 33 weeks along you? Oh, my gosh. I had one of my like anxiety nights where I ate a huge dinner and then I didn't feel her moving for a while, probably because she was in like a food coma. <laughs> but they make moms so crazy now where it's like you yes. need to you need to count kicks and have 10 kicks every two hours. And if you oh my don't. God. Eat oh, my God. That's so much worse than it was. You know, my kids are in their 20s. God, that's it's just terrible. It's so unconscionably cruel. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, is she okay? And yeah, I have She's no just contented or sleeping. Yeah. Or sleeping, sleeping at all. They you know? sleep like 90 to 95% of the time, but it's, it's all confusing to me because you hear different things from different providers where some will say you have to stop kind of twice a day at the same time and count stop and what? like just rest at the same time every day. And then try and count 10 kicks within a two hour period. <laughs> you know, you should be kicking someone. <laughs> the kick should be they yours. Have, no, they have apps for Take it. Luckily, that, I have a doctor. <laughs> now, luckily, my doctor is actually very chill and he's like, no apps. Like oh, they, have, great. they have apps for this. There's an app for everything. I'm, I was just thinking about this last night. When, when your baby comes out, you will find out, you probably already know that there are these monitors that you can put on your baby healthy newborn oh, baby yeah. in the crib and it measures yep. their um oxygen okay. level and their heart rate and their movement level and i was thinking when i was born there was a monitor above my bed and it was some cloves that had been sewn together by my old world grandma uh, and a piece of red ribbon and that was to keep me safe and that was <laughs> enough <laughs> and it worked i know there's confirmation bias cuz here i am alive but But nowadays you're expected to treat your child. And it sounds like even before they're born, as if everything is, is very high risk, as if they're in the neonatal intensive care unit, the second they get out, because all that stuff was developed for kids who really were 
you know, very severely, you know, big problems. Right. And now you're just supposed to use it on your regular baby and, and welcome to the world of parenthood. I mean, that is your perfect welcome because you're supposed to be worried every single second that your kid is at death's door. Yeah. And it's, it's tough because I, this is actually a, the next like mo geriatric mommy blog I'm writing. <laughs> and it's so appropriate that we're talking right now because this is your entire wheelhouse. Yes. And for people who don't know, we'll, we'll give a little introduction before this, but just tell people who are tuning in what, mm -hmm. what you're all about. Oh, so, and then we'll go back to the word geriatric. Yeah. It sounds like you're, you know, collecting social security and pregnant. My you know, doctor, it's like, oh, I got ARP and parents. My <laughs> doctor is really funny because he, I fell last week, which is always, right. it can be. Right. Yeah, and then you broke your hip. Right? And, and he was like, do you want me to have somebody help you down to the lobby? And I thought he was serious because I always joke, like, how, how come you guys don't give me a walker when I come in here? And he was like, I'm just kidding i'm just giving you crap and then and i was laughing I'm like, i appreciate his chill sense of humor about all of it it sounds like you got the right doctor yeah he's great he's and maybe the wrong parenting books <laughs> <laughs> i haven't really read any parenting books it's oh, that's really, really good it's really more like you just absorb it i think in the in the culture you know it's right. kind of everywhere and and in the parenting books even now i feel like they try to keep up with whatever like quote unquote, best practices. And I don't really know where this, you know, for example, we were talking about the, like kick counting, where that comes from. <laughs> that is comes that, from the ether. I just have never is heard that. Is that something that the never like heard of it. Never OB heard of it. society or whatever recommends? I don't mm. actually know. I'd have to look into it. But yeah, wow. t tell us, tell us about, oh, so tell us about you. All right. So me, uh, when my son was nine years old here in New York City, where I live, he'd started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace he'd never been before and let him find his own way home on the subway, which was his dearest desire. We had never thought about this before, even though we have an older son who calls himself the control group. <laughs> and um, <laughs> funny guy. And but we talked about it and we decided, yes, we would let him do this. And so one sunny Sunday, I took him. Uh, Izzy is our son's name. To Bloomingdale's and I left him there and I said, today's the day. It wasn't like he was like, where did my mom go? We knew yeah. that this was what was the plan. And sure enough, he took the subway home. You had to take the subway and then a bus because we lived in a cheaper part of the city and uh, came into the apartment levitating with pride, with excitement, you know, pleased that we had trusted him. And I'm a newspaper columnist by trade. And so I wrote a column why I let my nine year old ride the subway alone. And two days after the column, I was on the Today Show. MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, and finally on Bridget's show. Um, <laughs> it's only uh, taken, you know, being 11 you know, years. Yeah, it, it's actually 14. I think this one is 23. Wow. Anyways, actually, yeah, the, the anniversary is coming up for what it's worth. It doesn't seem to be celebrated internationally. The, the point is that um, it was it became this cultural touchstone. I mean, everybody started talking about, would you let them do it? And is Lenore a good parent or a bad parent? And I got the label America's worst mom, which you can Google. It's kind of funny if you're sitting next to somebody on a bus and you want to start up a conversation, you say, hey, why don't you Google that? And they're scared. I know you just had Amanda Knox on. It's like, it's like if you're sitting next to Amanda Knox, it's like, oh my God, the notoriety, I'm scared. <laughs> but I started a blog that weekend to get my site out, which, and I called it Free Range Kids. Mm -hmm. And over the years, you know, it was considered extraordinarily controversial to suggest that our kids are safer and smarter than our culture gives them credit for. And we don't have to be as worried every single second as, you know, the atmosphere is making you right now about the kicks. And even though it was considered like I was voted the most controversial mommy blogger for whatever that's worth for a couple of years back mm -hmm. then. But since then, the ideas have gained a lot of currency and people describe themselves as free rangers or free range parents. We've had some laws passed. And about three, about four years ago, I started a nonprofit sort of based on free range kids. And it started with uh, Jonathan Haidt, who you might have heard. Yep. Of. Everyone thinks he's Jonathan He's been Haidt. on. Oh, great. OK. Yep. So he wrote the, you know, he's a co-writer of The Coddling of the American Mind. Mm -hmm. And a man named Dan Shuckman, who's amazing. He was the chairman of FIRE, which fights for free speech on campus, as mm -hmm. I'm sure you're aware. And then uh, the other person besides me was Peter Gray who has uh, written extensively about how important free play is for kids, kids just on their own, doing stuff, making things happen, uh, goofing up, taking little risks, having fun. And we've sort of siphoned that out of kids' lives. And he thinks that that's why they're all so anxious and depressed. So, um, so he was the fourth founder and let grow 
is devoted to making it really normal to give kids back the independence that I'm guessing you geriatric mom, you probably grew up with, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird because I was thinking about it. Like LA is kind of, it's not the same LA that it was when I moved here 15 years ago. Wow. So it's much more dangerous there in, in the sense oh. that I feel more, my cousin and I were talking about this last night, just how we've both lived here for like 15 years. And we were, you know, we were talking about how we used to never really, we could like take our dogs out at night and not mm -hmm. be worried. And there's a lot more vagrancy and drug addiction and crime. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about like the, the story of the nine-year-old kid. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, if I was living in a smaller town or like a cul-de-sac area or <laughs> a suburb, I don't think I'd have any problem. But being in LA right now, I don't know how I would feel about that just because it feels darker. There's just a darkness to the city right now that I'm not sure. And I know that this is actually from my friends who live in New York. They, you know, a lot of them who took the subway, young women, like they don't even take the subway anymore because they don't feel safe. And because of a lot of the stuff that's happened over there. So yeah, I'm not sure like that. That was an area where I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, it's going to be nine years from now. Right. Yeah. And and if exactly. L.A. changed this much, it could change back. You just don't know. New York feels darker. It actually reminds me I moved here in the 80s and it exactly. sort of is reminding me of that, which I have seen needles on the ground, which I don't recall seeing for like 30 years. That's when and we left. I was born in New York City in 78 oh. and we mm -hmm. left in 80. Basically, they had my brother and then they were like, we're we're getting out of here. So and they moved to where? We, my dad took a job in Minnesota. And so, and then we were in Minnesota. I mean, we were definitely free range kids and almost yeah. too free range, I would say, to the point that it was like maybe considered neglectful later in our like teenage years. <laughs> like we didn't, we didn't have anyone supervising us at all. It, it for large portions of our young kind of 12, 13, 14 teen years. So mm -hmm. I don't know that I would give my child as much. I mean, I remember my aunt calling my dad and being like, your children need food. <laughs> like, oh, wow. <laughs> they're scrounging through the cabinets and drinking <laughs> like pickle juice and eating they're dry they're spaghetti. drinking their own urine. <laughs> Please come. <laughs> right, pick them yeah. Up. <laughs> so we were we were very free range children. And we always kind of joke like we did a horrible job raising our parents. Um, <laughs> Wait, so I have to pause here um, because free range gets defined as like a spectrum of things. And in my definition, which I think I get because because I trademark free range kids, <laughs> uh, it's it's not neglect. <laughs> it is deliberately or sometimes by necessity giving kids some independence that is sort of reasonable for their age. But it right. doesn't involve no bedtimes. It doesn't involve no rules. It doesn't involve never using Western medicine or never eating a preserved you know, piece of candy or whatever. Or it's, throwing um, keggers in the basement. Keggers in the basement is not, I mean, I, I read my book myself. Um, it doesn't have anything about keggers. keggers there's, like a, there's like a circle with a line through it. <laughs> right? So no keggers in the basement. No, dress up in the basement. That's what we did. And we had big yeah. cardboard boxes that we made into houses. I mean, just uh, to me, what's missing from kids' lives is not, I don't want parents to be absent from their children's lives. I want them to be absent sometime, right. <laughs> you know? like not with them on every play date, not making every choice for them or making these fake choices like, honey, you can have the organic pear or the organic apricot. Right. You know, I want kids to have some time when they have to, you know, decide something on their own or figure something out. Cause I, the, the worry I have now, and for a long time, it's been about like anxiety and depression among kids. And if you've talked to John Haidt, he's, I guess it's a podcast. You couldn't have seen him, but he has all these charts that show, you know, anxiety spiking and depression going up and self-harm and stuff like that. But what I'm most interested in now is passivity, <laughs> just a, a desire on young kids part to like, they're not going to do anything until you give them the exact instructions. Mm. And it's not even that they're like goody goodies or ass kissers or anything like that. It's that they 
they they have become so used to being told exactly what to do. And if they're not told exactly what to do, somebody is following them on an app and making sure they do exactly what they're supposed to do, whether that's in school or outside the school or in an organized activity. So I don't know if they develop the the sort of like, hey, let's, you know, I don't want it to be let's have a kegger in the basement, but, you know, let's have a party, let's climb a tree. Right. Um, what if we play the game backwards? Wouldn't that be fun? Just a little bit of creativity and can do It's it seems sort of evaporated. And actually, there are studies that show that like kids in the 80s who scored in the median uh, or just in the middle of some survey of how creative they are. There's some tests that they can take are like anybody with that score today would be considered like a creative genius. Wow. Because the, the amount of creativity has been going down. And I think as the amount of free time has been going down and yeah. freedom. <laughs> freedom, free time. I think there are two things that I think a lot about. And we, to be fair, a lot of this stuff happened, like my neglectful aspects of parenting happened after my parents were divorced. But when my parents mm-hmm. were together, we very much like in my kind of golden age of, youth. One summer, I particularly remember we got up at 7 a.m. every morning. I'm the oldest of five. Oh, my God. We all got on our bikes, the three oldest, Uh and we rode miles to the point. This was in Connecticut. And Mm -hmm. we we would pack our bags and our lunch. They gave us money if we wanted to go get ice cream. And we would be at the beach alone like all day long. And we got swimming lessons. That's why we had to be there at 730 in the ocean. And then my mom would come with the two littles maybe later on. Sometimes, sometimes not. But we were, I was probably 12. My brother was probably, you know, we're all like basically around two years apart. So we mm-hmm. were like 9, 11, 12-ish mm-hmm. age, which I think is when... My nephew started riding his bike around, you know, and and then we had a massively huge family. And we always joke about this when I see my cousins because we would all go to the beach and my aunts and uncles would sit on the beach and they'd hang out and talk and drink and catch up with each other. And there were mm-hmm. 10 kids in my dad's family. And wow. Wow. So there were 26 <laughs> grandkids. Your ethnicity. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Irish Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so we there were like 10 of us born within four or five years. There's like a two, two I you were baby say four booms. or five hours. <laughs> <laughs> it was close like that. And we would just go wander out on the rocks on this pier. Yeah. And we were talking about how we'd be jumping into the ocean. We were pretty little kids. I mean, we were old enough. And there was always like older kids kind of, my, you know, monitoring the younger ones. But we were not an eye shot of our parents by any wow. by any means. Mm-hmm. We would just be like jumping into these pools. And my brother and his my cousin would stay at this little beach house alone that my grandmother sometimes rented. And they would go <laughs> take a boat out and go fishing like we had we had a lot of that freedom and the ability to be creative. We're very limited. You know, I see what happens with the kids now. It's like an inability to be bored because they're so used to being entertained all the time and having like a a screen or an app or something or an adult or an adult. And then the constant appeal to authority. My cousins and I talk about this all the time. We come from like our, our, our parents were her parents in particular were so great about being like, that's a kid problem. Go work it out. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, they were just like, we'd come be like, nah, 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 nah. and they'd be like, that's a kid problem. Go work it out. Don't bother. I love us. that phrase, actually. <laughs> um, it's so interesting. So everything you're saying resonates with me, but let me just say what it it sounded like to me when you're talking, you know, I know that there was rehab by the time you were an older teen. So I can't say that this sounds like the the perfect childhood, even though it does. Well, (laughs) it was, I think up until my parents, honestly, I can trace it all to like when my parents got divorced and then it just, that's what I mean. It's like, I would say I started going off the rails when there was just less attention being paid to Mm -hmm. Both my parents got in other relationships. I think this happens a lot. I see this happen a lot with parents and divorce. When I talk to parents who get divorced, I'm like, do not put your dating life before your kids. This is like mm-hmm. the worst thing. And and I understand the instinct, but it happens. And we ended up with a like my stepdad was not well. So he took up a lot of my mom's energy and time and focus. And we just kind of 
got we a manipulated the situation, manipulated the divorce as kids do. Okay. Um, if, if certain their creativity parent, there, <laughs> yeah. And we also took advantage of the like complete lack of kind of, you know, nobody was checking in. I was like a straight A student, but nobody was really making me do my homework anymore. No one. So then at a certain point, I'm like, why am I even doing this? So, yeah, it was we moved a lot. That was like a hard thing Mm -hmm. about my childhood up until when my parents got divorced. But then when they got divorced, it was it took on like a whole other level. Right. So it sounds like, I mean, you know, this will sound self-serving, but it sounds like it went from free range to neglect, <laughs> you know, right. parents who I, I mean, loved so- you, cared about you and trusted you to parents who paid, who were checked out. Yeah. And I, it's weird. I like, I hesitate to even use the word neglect only because I don't, I'm still so protective of my parents, even though I can Mm -hmm. objectively look at this and go, yeah, it was, it was pretty neglectful. (laughs) Let's say, you know, a a sort of inappropriate (laughs) lack of, you know, sort of severe levels of not paying attention. Right. I think I just had my dad. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there were moments where we were like, we probably should have been taken out of that house. <laughs> so yeah, although I'm sure that would have been terrible too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's a no win situation. So yeah, it definitely went from like kind of normal and then to like more extreme dysfunction. So <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say like I right. think that if we had continued on the trajectory we were on, it would yeah. have been like yeah, the ideal kind of ideal childhood. My cousin Maggie, who co-produces this with me, hi Maggie. She has incredible boundaries because her parents were very much like they put the marriage first. They were very much like our marriage came before you, mm-hmm. and a grown-up time is our time. Kid problems are kid problems. You guys have mm-hmm. to learn how to work this stuff out. Mm-hmm. Um, they had you know very clear boundaries and expectations for their kids, and I think Maggie you know, my sisters and I are always like, Maggie just has this like inner sense of strength and confidence. And, and that is good parenting, you know, and also good luck and good genes. I mean, the other thing is there's no exact formula. And if you follow the recipe perfectly, you get, uh, you know, the perfect kid and otherwise all bets are off. So um, I keep writing little notes to myself is that, you know, kid problems are your problems. What I love about that is it's, it's not dismissive, it's trust, right? And and um, what I what I feel has been leached out of this generation is we're sort of not allowed to trust our kids. We're always supposed to be there. I mean, you can't even leave them at a birthday party. Right. You can't you know, if they get on a bus now, there's these electronic things that let you know your kid is on the bus and you, you know their grades every second that they get them and you can find out their behavior. And it's all ends up being like back to, you know, that the parents should be in constant control. And if we're talking about passivity. There, you're going to be passive if somebody is micromanaging you because why bother doing anything else? You're going to be told what to do. If you if you try anything, any shenanigans, it's going to be caught. And sometimes it's not shenanigans. Sometimes it's going to get a, a candy bar because it's so thrilling, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's jumping off the rocks because you're scared, but you want to see if you can do it. And then you do it and you grow this new confidence and you're excited about life as opposed to saying somebody saying, uh, you know, I'll jump with you or I'll watch you or I'll be there. You know, you can you can jump up and down on trampoline while I'm here. So trusting kids to solve some of their own problems and to make some of their own fun is it's like essential. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't give that to kids a lot because we're told we are always supposed to be there. And if we're not physically there, then we are electronically there watching them via an app. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. A lot of you might know that I was a former smoker, and I've smoked a lot of different substances in my life. Being in recovery, cigarettes were the last thing I quit, and it was the hardest thing I had to quit, which is why I'm really excited to partner with Fume. Fume is a natural inhaler designed for a better, safer, and natural way to quit cigarettes. It's a no smoke, no vape, and no nicotine replacement for the hand-to-mouth habit of smoking. The hand-to-mouth habit is one of the hardest aspects of quitting smoking, in my opinion. Fume is made of 100% Canadian maple and uses cores infused with plant oils studied to curb craving. Whether you're a smoker or an ex-smoker who still struggles with cravings, Fume is the perfect tool for you. It's time to create positive habits and quit naturally with Fume, and we're here to make it easier. Right now, if you head to breathefume.com slash welcome and use promo code welcome, you are going to save 10% off your entire order. 
You'll be saving money on cigarettes you aren't smoking and buying anymore and save on your initial purchase of Fume. That's 10% off your entire order when you head to B-R-E-A-T-H-E-F-U-M dot com slash welcome and use the code welcome. Our next partner, Athletic Greens, has a product my husband uses literally every day. He started taking AG1 because he was looking for a multivitamin and he was feeling like he wasn't getting enough of the greens in his diet. He's not huge on taking lots of pills and vitamins and wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. And so he started taking AG1 and absolutely loves it. This is a guy who's not a huge fan of green drinks. And that's why I really like that they think of this as a nutritional drink. But it has a nice fruity flavor. AG1 is a small micro habit with big benefits. With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery, focus, and aging, all the things. It supports better sleep quality and recovery and mental clarity and alertness. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash W-I-W. That is athleticgreens.com slash W-I-W to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I remember having a really fascinating and traumatizing <laughs> dinner with family members and it was a holiday and they were new parents and they oh. had the baby monitor at the Christmas dinner, like on the table and they were <laughs> just watching the baby through the entire dinner. And I was, I'm like, I don't want to be that parent, but I can understand knowing my levels of anxiety, even seeing how I feel pregnant. And then I feel guilty about being anxious. Oh God, there's no winning. Right, right. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what, that's what my husband was saying. He's like, she's fine. Everything's fine. You know, there's no reason to think everything, anything's wrong. And I was like, but that makes me nervous too. And he's like, right, right, right. My good luck has to stop. Right, right, right. This is a streak. (laughs) Right. No, it is, it is, it is scary. But one thing that I was taught by a woman named Susan Lynn about even baby monitors is what she was talking about. She says that these, you know, the promise is that this will give you the peace of mind you need. But like I was saying, my parents had peace of mind with the cloves yeah. <laughs> over my bed. And if you think that a monitor that is giving you a blip every second is going to give you peace of mind, because the second th- th- there actually was a hospital that was doing a study where they gave children who had been preemies these little pads that they would sleep on. And if they weren't moving enough, it would set off an alarm because they were really worried that these preemies might be in danger when they mm-hmm. went home. So first of all, it was electronics that were invented for kids with problems. And then the problem became that it kept going off and parents got no sleep and they were constantly afraid. And then the study proved that this actually wasn't making kids any safer anyway. And so they got rid of them, but then they came back in through the regular marketplace. And the thing to be aware of as you go on this journey is that Anything that was developed for kids with severe problems ends up leaching into everyday life. So these monitors, which were for babies who were preemies, are now sold to, you know, for mothers. And this will give you peace of mind. And there's early intervention. There's there's classes for children starting at four months old. I kid you not in New Jersey. I'm sure they're in L.A. too, that teach kids to start paying attention to sound and sights. And it's like as if that wouldn't happen automatically. But if a kid right. has a severe problem, they would need help. Right. But we're rewriting all of childhood as if the kid is in extreme danger, either physically, emotionally, psychologically. There's always a problem that if you only pay more attention, literally watch over them every single second, perhaps if you're really good and don't like sneeze or turn away to eat a cookie, you can keep them alive or, right. or get them into Harvard. <laughs> either way. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's the interesting thing to observe even Last night when I was having one like my anxious moment and Mm. my husband's like, why don't you write or why don't you, you know, do something or distract yourself? I'm like, I have to sit with this and be (laughs) uncomfortable because there's no I'll either be distracting myself or which is fine. That's like a good tool. But distracting is great. 
Yeah. And it, and it works, but I'm like, I also know myself that I'm, you know, he's like, do your Spanish. That always distracts you. Cause I've been doing like Duolingo to just <laughs> uh-huh. like take my mind away. Right. La but I know that when I get into a certain, like if it's at a certain kind of point that yeah. I won't be able to focus on anything. And the only way for me to kind of get through that writing does help or to just sit with it and be like, I have to deal with this internally. Like you said, I can't again, be like appealing to something outside of me to try and, and soothe me. You know, I'm like, mm-hmm. I have to like learn how to, I can't ask for her to soothe me and I can't be mm-hmm. looking for like the right mantra on YouTube to soothe me (laughs) as the ancients did. (laughs) Yes. I just have to have some sort of like it, it. There is a certain point where you have to just kind of have trust and faith and turn it over and remember that this is, you know, there's a lot of this that's really completely out of my control and out of my hands. The, the control thing. And I heard you talking about this with Amanda Knox too, is the biggest worry maker. Um, the idea that you have the ability to make or break the perfect child. And if you do everything right, okay, like apparently Maggie's parents did. But if you do one thing wrong, you give them a cookie instead of an apple slice. Uh, You know, you let them wait in the car for five minutes while you run into CVS. If you say, um, good boy, instead of good job, you know, so you praise the child instead of praising the effort. I mean, all these things, all bets are off. And there are books, you know, there's so many books that are telling you exactly how to do literally everything, how to put your kids to bed, how to feed them the right foods and what age. And it's like, you really do need, like there's this great show right now on Apple plus called becoming you. Mm -hmm. And it's about the first 2000 days of a child's life in all these other cultures. Oh, cool. It's really, it's, it's mind blowing and it's really fascinating. And I'm going to watch this. And I usually don't think babies are that cute, but either they found the world's cutest babies or I'm going soft in my old age, (laughs) but uh, in my geriatric years, but, (laughs) but there's one. So one of the places they go is off of Borneo. And I actually have no idea where Borneo is, but it's somewhere and it looks very verdant. And then there are people who live on stilt houses in the water and they have to dive for clams to eat. And so they get very good at swimming. And one day the parents have to go someplace, which means, you know, hopping in their canoe and going Mm -hmm. off and they leave their child at home. How old is their child? Three and a half. Uh (laughs) Right. And, um, you know, first of all, of course, they'd be in jail for the rest of their lives as, you know, neglectful parents. But so they leave the three and a half if they were here. So they leave the three and a half year old there. And then the kids from another house across the way. And that means across ocean water to another house in the water say come over and play don't just play with your toys come over and play and you see the little girl saying don't tease me and they're like come on you can play you can come here and she has practiced swimming some with her parents but she's never swum by herself and she's never dived off the side you know because there's a ladder this time you see you know you wonder how long the cameraman was there (laughs) it could have been weeks but you see her go and you see her go to the edge and then not just like a kid on a on a diving board, yeah. you know, a high dive, but then you find, and it is higher than a high dive. And then finally you see her and she jumps in the water and darned if there isn't a cameraman in the water <laughs> to watch her swimming to the friend's house and climbing up the, the rickety little ladder to play with them. And, you know, you think if three and a half year olds can swim 50 yards from one house to another, maybe your nine-year-old can walk to school. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Maybe your 10-year-old can stay home for an hour while you go to the flea market. So we just have so, we really have to recalibrate what we think kids can do because we've had a couple of generations of all the experts saying they can't do anything safely enough. So yeah. the only response is for you to always be there. That was something that was really illuminated <laughs> to me when I was traveling around in particular, like Egypt and mm-hmm. Sri Lanka and India. And I'll never forget being we were in we were in Luxor about to do like a Nile cruise, but we had a couple of days in Luxor mm-hmm. and there was this little kid, little Mo. He was probably six or seven <laughs> years <son's> old. Name. <laughs> oh, he son. was the cutest kid. And he uh-huh. was with all the guys who were. Um, They had the guys who would give you like the horse and buggy rides. And then he had his little shoe shining kit and he was speaking like 17 languages, you know, just trying to get your attention. Like he knew how to say like, (laughs) mom, mom, like, (laughs) but in like German (laughs) and and Spanish, like trying to figure out what's going to get your attention. And 
I'll never, ever, as long as I live, it was burned into my brain, you know, it's watching him. It was laid out. It was probably 11 o'clock at night. And yeah. I, I guess his mom had passed away and his dad was at home with some kind of injury. We got like oh the whole God. story. And so he was kind of being raised by these older boys and wow. taken under the, his the wing. So, yeah, he was running the the little the carriage guys were kind of going off. And then we see little Mo running after the carriage with his little shoe shining kit. And they just like grab him and bring him up. And I'm like, this this would never happen. <laughs> and, like, and we were joking. We're like, we should adopt him. Can we adopt him? I know. Was that's that- what I was just thinking, which is really, really culturally <laughs> wrong. We, but it, sounds, we were, it does sound fantastic. And then we were joking like, yeah, so we can ruin him. Like he'll right. be playing video games and like speak only one language with like. Right, right. Ma- Mountain Dew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's in front of, yeah. It's like, do I really have to do my homework? I don't want to go. Yeah. Yeah. They're just as more there's a more a more chill approach i think with with kids and they have a lot more freedom a lot of it is out of necessity you know so a lot of it is like his situation sounds like it was born out of necessity and he was trying to make some extra money for the family at like six and seven years old but he was also the the village does kind of step in and yeah just such a funny i mean Mm -hmm. just I just want to say something. So even the fact that you've mentioned, like, you know, he speaks all these different languages and probably says, do you want to shoe shine yeah. in all of them? But, <laughs> you know, one of the things Peter Gray, my the guru, I love so much. He talks about kids learn when they're engaged, you know, and also when they're moving. And the hardest information to get into anyone, including kids, is information when they're sedentary and bored and they don't see any point. So I think if if little Mo had been in school and they were learning the shoe is on the sock yeah. repeat after me, the shoe, is, mm-hmm. you know, it's so boring because it has no relevance and it's just a language and it's just another class taught by an adult. But when you, you know, by necessity and also curiosity, like how, you know, and just drinking in information as children mm-hmm. do. And if the only information we're giving them is constantly almost it's all teachable moments, <laughs> like either they're at school or they're at an after school program, which is also run by an adult or they're home. And we're teaching them broccoli starts with a B. You yeah. know, it's it all becomes C for consent. That was what yeah. I heard recently for, C like, for consent. For, yeah. Wow. Right. Right. And no, 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 means, no. wait. Um, <laughs> this so, was wait. for like a four year old, by the way, <laughs> totally I, off topic. But <laughs> yeah, I, I believe it. But I did want to segue over to a, an actual study that's being was done and then hopefully will be done in a bigger way. So there's these professors at Georgetown and um, one of them's from Russia. Her name's Yulia. And what they're worried about is that kids are getting their independence, like mo like independence so late that they've actually missed the window when they were supposed to be developing normal risk awareness mm. because you know, Mother Nature expects kids a lot more like Mo than like my Mo, <laughs> for instance, right. than, than American kids. And it's sort of like language. That's why I was thinking about it. It's like, you know, if you learn language after 10, 11, 12, it's not like you can't learn it. You're learning, you know, your Duolingo, which I tried and totally gave up on. But, you know, at some <laughs> point you do, it's harder, right? You learn it with an accent. It takes forever. It's it's painful. Yeah, and you can do it, but it, but it, you'll have an it just doesn't come as fluidly and you're not as fluent. Mm-hmm. But so they did this preliminary study or pilot study, I guess, of where they talked to college students in Canada and the United States and also Russia and Turkey. Uh, and let's call those the Mo countries. Right. <laughs> and they asked them the same situations, like like sitting in a cafe by yourself late at night or whatever. Is this safe or unsafe? And what the Russian and Turkish college kids thought is obviously it's safe. You're sitting in a cafe. It's a public place or whatever. I don't even know what the examples were but they were very normal to me, seemingly undangerous situations. And the American kids had this wrong risk calibration and they kept like pinging, like dangerous, dangerous. You shouldn't be there. It's scary. And so we are doing our kids a disservice. Not that we don't have them shoe shining at age seven at eight, you know, at 11 o'clock at night and then writing rickety things back home, but not giving them any independence to make some, you know, to jump off the rocks, like you were talking about, or climb a tree or maybe, you know, decide, you know, to do something that is a little risky. And I'm not talking about jumping off a roof, although I do hear stories about that all the time, but like in Russia, (laughs) yeah, really all they do. Um, (laughs) You heard about that Ukrainian kid who was 11 and walked 750 miles. Oh yeah. I did hear about that. I read that yesterday. Yeah. Everybody's sending it to me because of course it's amazing, 
But I and I keep responding and you'll see it on Twitter that the American Academy of Pediatrics says you shouldn't cross the street alone until you're 10. And and so that's why I don't blame helicopter parents. Right. And I like that T-shirt that your husband was designing for you, like future (laughs) helicopter parent, because there's almost no way that you can't be a helicopter parent. If the authorities in your country are saying you have to hold your kid's hand right. till age 10 and that they, you know, they shouldn't be alone after school and they shouldn't ever be alone in a car and they shouldn't walk to school. And some schools don't let you drop your kid. Don't let the bus drop the kid off after school unless there's an adult, their pre-approved adult, of course, ready to walk them home, even if they live two houses down. And if they, you know, if there's no adult there, the kid will be brought back to the bus depot, which is where I always think they'll be raped and murdered. That's what I thought when I was a kid. That was my biggest fear. I was like a worried little kid. I was the last one off the bus. And Mm. I was always like, I'm going to end up at that bus depot. I know it. Wow. (laughs) And somehow, I guess it was your your jujitsu that kept you safe. (laughs) I mean, I had a creepy bus driver, to be fair. He always used to ask me what I sucked my thumb and he always used to ask me what flavor my thumb was. And it always. That's not creepy. Oh, my God. It felt creepy to me. Even as a child. Did he keep saying, you're sucking your thumb? (laughs) That's creepy. But if it's like, what flavor? It's just like a guy like who doesn't have another joke. And, I know, you know, has I know. a way to connect. I don't know why I remember this, though. If it, it did make me feel <laughs> creeped out. But I was a little kid that was terrified of being kidnapped. And I don't know if it's because oh. I terrified. And I don't know if it's because I was like, a, that's why I think my natural, my dad is like a worry wart. And when you talk about genetics, I have <laughs> a, I am predisposed to being a worry wart and was like such a worried little kid. And then I was the oldest of five. And so I was constantly counting heads and I, I noticed myself doing it this past summer, even on the beach. And my siblings were all like, oh, my God, Bridget, you are such the like oldest sibling because I was like counting all their kids. They're like, they're fine. And you know, I would count kids on the beach. That does scare me. I mean, the, the beach, right? There's, yeah, there's waves. It, <laughs> right? it makes there's it on me, your toe. <laughs> yeah. And just like, but I've always been like, we used to fly alone. This was pre 9-11. And when my mm-hmm. parents got divorced, I was in charge of all wow. the kids navigating the airports, making sure everybody was like settled down on the plane. And my younger siblings were pretty young. So I think I still have. And I was this is what I was writing about. I'm like, I can think of the time we thought my brother was kidnapped or drowned because he disappeared because he was across the street playing video games. Of course. And of course, and um, like my being the oldest, I was the one that was there when my brother fell down the stairs. My sister ate mushrooms and needed her stomach pumped. My other really there was always like some chaos going on because we were I mean, not to hire you as a babysitter. (laughs) No, it wasn't because I was babysitting. It was just like having five kids who were running around the house like accidents happen. And so there's like that's the thing with I think having that freedom, you, Mm -hmm. I broke my wrist. Like we moved into a new place and I was riding my bike and I didn't have Mm -hmm. shoes on and broke my wrist. Like the day we moved into this new place and we were just like going out to explore the neighborhood, my brother and I. Wow. So there was, so I have a lot of like, like stories. I mean, the other thing people worry about is like kids today have no stories to tell. You know, yeah. if, if nothing happened, what happened? Oh, then I was in the back seat I got and I had my iPad online. and I was going to soccer. And then what? Oh, well, then when I was 11, I was in the back seat coming back from soccer. And then what? Well, then I was soccer at 12. Oh, my gosh. Soccer. You should hear my dad and his sibling stories. I mean, yeah, yeah. They used More to like, exciting. there were so many of them. They would leave kids in New York when they would go to New York. They just, there was just too many kids to keep track wow. of. They have stories of like, you know, jumping into snowbanks off their roof and stuff. Like oh. They were jumping off the roof. So yeah, that, that does come up a lot. That always seems like the stupidest thing. Um, <laughs> the other thing is like, I'm not, I'm not a daredevil at all. And I'm very, I'd say I'm, you know, part helicopter and on my mom's side. And so it's not like I, embrace actual risk. Right. But I mean, so one of the things we encourage schools to do is the let grow project. And that is that a kid gets a homework assignment, go home and do something new on your own without your parents. You can Mm. walk the dog. You can, you cannot jump off the roof. You can, you discuss (laughs) it with your parents. It has to be agreed upon, but, but the things that these seventh graders are doing, and these are 12 and 13 year olds in a, in a very safe suburb of New York are the, the, the things that they haven't done yet. That they are, I mean, I'm just going to read you a couple, except yeah, that my please do. Uh, yeah. So what would you, it was, the question is, what would you like to do, but you're a little scared or hesitant to try? Okay. 
So these are 12 and 13 year old answers. Uh, not, not that the answers are from 12 or 13 year olds, either kids, those ages answering. <laughs> um, I wasn't comfortable going into a crowded store with a bunch of strangers without my mom. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think that's interesting because the whole stranger danger became any human being who isn't my mom. <laughs> is, yeah. Is, 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 why would I? It's like going into the lion's den. It's like, actually, those are just shoppers. They're not strangers. So it was interesting. I was hesitant to try walking my dog alone because I was scared that he would get loose from the leash or a scary man would take me. So that's a little bit of you in there, the fear. I was afraid to climb a tree because I was scared I was going to fall and break a bone. Another kid, I want to do a wheelie on my bike, but I was scared I might hurt myself. And then this one, there's two that really interest me. One is I was afraid to try and cook because there's an open flame and I could get hurt. And when I first started asking kids about these, you know, like, what would you like to do on your own? When kids would say, I want to make scrambled eggs, but I'm so afraid of the stove and I don't want to burn down the house or I want to make toast yeah. and I'm afraid and I don't want to burn down the house. I thought because they were in Manhattan at a magnet school, I thought they were histrionic. I thought the teacher had told them, you know, make your story dramatic and they had nothing dramatic to say. So they pretended that they were afraid that they would burn down the house. And then I started hearing it around the country. And it was so interesting to me because this like tiny non risks were being rewritten as, you know, like Mount Vesuvius. And then, and then this one kid, and I've heard several kids since then say the same thing. I was hesitant to use a sharp knife as my parents had never let me before. Right. That's the, uh, the cooking thing is a big one. I think, you know, we, we were cooking pretty young and I see kids now and like, they haven't even gone near a stove at age 13 And like, again, out of necessity, there were so many of us. We were doing Mm -hmm. our own laundry when we were like 10, 11, 12. So there were a lot of chores that forced us to learn things at a younger age that now kids just don't seem to have like any clue how to do if they had to like do the, you know, you watch Home Alone and you're like, Hmm. No kid would be able to do any of this stuff. No, no, he'd be, right. he'd be dead meat, right? And I They'd think the to... kidnapping thing is interesting because there's less instance of it. But when we, you know, in my defense of my own fear of being kidnapped, wherever that came from, I, I mm-hmm. was a child of the 80s. Oh, I know. And that was when the, like the stranger danger cartons. was the milk cartons. Yeah, milk it was cartons. at its height. So I, I, I think I was like probably six around six, seven years old, those ages when, and I would be like, are you going to be at the bus stop when I get home? Are you going to be here when I get dropped off? Are you going to be here? Are you going to, I was like a crazy person about it, but it's because we were just being kind of like saturated. Yeah. It's saturated is the perfect word. Yeah. I mean, like imagine a a cloth being saturated with that. You just, you can wring it and it'll still be wet, (laughs) you know? And that really was those, those milk carton kids, the national center for missing and exploited children, put them on the milk carton starting in 84 and nationally in 84. And what they neglected to mention is that the vast majority of those kids were runaways Mm -hmm. or taken by a parent in a custodial dispute, and they were not kidnapped by strangers. And without that context, it started looking like, oh, you know, who's this week's kid? You know, who got stolen this week? Oh, her. Oh, she looks like my friend. And it really warped the vision of what childhood in America could be, because if you thought that letting your kid walk outside was, you know, OK, but I'll see you on a milk carton next week. It's not worth it. And right. that is really when childhood began to change. And if you ask people your age and older, you know, what age were they allowed to play outside? It's usually five, six, seven, eight. And then anybody born in the 90s or later say 10, 11, 12, 13, because by the time that became, by the time that idea had saturated America, we decided that it wasn't worth the risk because we got the risk so wrong. Not that there's no risk, but there's no, but there's risk at home too. You said your kid, you know, one fell down the stairs. I mean, the idea is somehow we think that if you're always with your kids or always supervising them, there's no risk. There's no risk inside the home. It's just all outside the home when they're on their own. And that rewrote childhood. And if you ask me, the risks are what we were talking about at the beginning, depression, anxiety, and this weird passivity and rule, you know, instruction, like a waiting to be programmed. (laughs) That Mm -hmm. seems, that seems depressing to me. I mean, it seems like childhood is supposed to have a little bit of spark of fun and surprise and goofiness. And if it's all being perfect, that's step 40. And if that's a word, some of my favorite things are videos that my sister and I would make when we were grounded, we'd be grounded for like doing something or talking back or whatever. 
Uh And we have these like hilarious videos where we turn a refrigerator box into a TV and we videotaped it. And it was me reading the news, which is actually hilarious, given that I do my like dumb fake news show now in my garage. Um, I'm still doing that, apparently. But we were so creative. I mean, we had these we had a video where we were uh, like pretending that we were trying to like leave a party and I put a balloon on my finger and snapped it when my sister like fake slapped me. And it looks real. <laughs> like, wow. It, it wow. looks and sounds like and we die laughing every time we see it. And we were just we had lots of board games. We were always playing board games. We had at one point like w- the house we lived in, we all had to be on one floor. It wasn't separated by rooms. So it was just all five of us. It's in like, one. A dorm? <laughs> like, like a dorm? Kind of. It was a giant hall. dorm. Wow, cool. It was just an open, open, open plan. Room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess they'd call these Before days. it's time. Yes. But it was really just a ranch that had a big, giant, open room that was Probably like the family room. room. Yeah. I mean, it actually was the family room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> think about it. And we would just like, we lived up there and did just played Barbies and played mm. Playmobil and Legos. And I do not see kids doing that so much anymore. We didn't have like tablets and devices. And my parents were definitely, that was one area I felt like they were really good when they were still together was being like, you know, you get very limited amounts of television and Mm -hmm. it's a a reward for, for like doing something or finishing your homework Mm -hmm. or it's not just, or like come home, let your brain tune out for an hour and then you have to turn it off. But it was always like we couldn't sit and like binge watch TV or, you know, turn our brains into pudding on no. TikTok. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I didn't. TikTok was not my brain pudding, but I, I did watch a lot of TV after school. But there's two things I, that your story about your videos with your sister make me think about. And that is that you were you really wanted to be on TV. I mean, I know a lot of kids play whatever they are, but that's something that you absolutely loved. And then also you were being funny, right? You yeah. know, it's like, oh my God, look, she hit me and boom, you know, what a, <laughs> what a clap. So one of the, like, I try to think of like ways to change the culture so that we recognize the value, not just of hovering and helping, but of stepping back. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard when we've discussed all these things, like the American Academy of Pediatrics is telling you never step back. You gotta, you know, take your kid in a, you know, a onesie or what is it? A, a baby Bjorn until they're off to college. So, so what... <laughs> What would help? And so one of the things I did some research on is the idea that what you, if you have free time, and it sounds like you had enforced free time when you were home with your sister being grounded, when you have free time, you will find something that interests you. And you might not find it if you don't have free time, because you might be spending all your time in lacrosse and Kumon. And those two are not to be okay, but they're not things that you absolutely love. And so I interviewed people about what they... I mean, I, I, I would have interviewed you, but you just told me like what they did as a kid that they can still sort of see them doing to this day. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you my favorite story because I can't remember most of them. I'll tell you two if you want. But one story was a businessman. I had like three minutes of time with him because I met him at a TED talk and asked, what did you do as a kid that you still are doing today? You know, and he said nothing. I was like, no, it's not really an interesting answer. I said, what did you can you think of anything that you liked to do as a child? that you're doing to this day. Now I played. I'm like, could you think a little deeper? And finally he said, like a little light bulb went off and he said, well, actually come to think of it. Grew up in Miami, fruit trees, fruit trees on people's property, but they hang over the sidewalk and the fruit that falls on the sidewalk is for anyone, right? So he would pick it up and put it in his little red wagon and then walk around the neighborhood and sell it. So we went walking around the neighborhood selling other people's stuff. And that's Jeff... Jeff Bezos. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that. I, just, <laughs> I love it. I, he's like nothing. And then he's like, actually, the giant billion dollar empire that I created right. started <laughs> when I was six or whatever. And, and there are other people, too, that I talked to. I, one woman I love. She's a I don't, I'll tell you what I'll tell you what she did as a kid. And I'll tell you what she did. She used to call people randomly out of the phone book and survey them. Does your child play an instrument? What instrument? How many years? And now she's a professor of sociology at wow. uh, the University of California. Irvine. That's Barbara like um, Oprah tells a story about how she used to um, interview crows. No. She would like as a little kid. I mean, this could be self-made mythology or whatever. You know, oh. you create that stuff. But she tells a story about or her one of her grand aunts or someone tells a story of how she used to like interview like cr- the crows and corn husks that she would have. And she was wow. always like interviewing these 
these things long before she ever became Oprah. And my mom still has a book that I made about the cycle of life. I illustrated it and wrote it (laughs) when I was like in, in first grade or kindergarten. And I bound it and I was, you know, I really loved writing and wanted to write books. And a lot of that stuff is still, I do think with kids, and that's one of the things that I really loved when I was working with autistic kids, I was certified because I'm not a, a like a behavioral, th- you know, therapist, an ABA person, right? Yeah. They wanted art- artists because they okay. were training us in the sunrise program, which I don't know if you're familiar with They're it, They're kind of based out Massachusetts. I believe he had an autistic son. It was really anti ABA where it was instead of, um, you know, rewarding a kid for saying a word and um, a lot of the standards that they had had, it was join the child in what they're doing and try and use play and creativity and a lot of like, yes, anding to Mm -hmm. draw language and eye contact out of these kids who might be. And it was amazing. I mean, some of the stuff that I saw come out of these kids and just watching their own patterns of Like instead of if the kid becomes obsessed with coat hangers, you say, no, we're not going to do this. You just say, okay, And you like fully lean into it. So there was like the coat hanger phase where we were and then we were hanging coats. And (laughs) there was a phase as he got older where he was obsessed with roller coasters. So we were going to Six Flags every (laughs) single weekend. We got to see like seasons pass. And then he just would like kind of wear himself out of it. And it was really fascinating for me to observe instead of having to like put my agenda on this child, allow the child to. And now he was always obsessed with bees. And now he's a young adult and he mm-hmm. has a job as like a beekeeper. It's one of the things oh, that he can I'm so do. Glad. Oh my God. That's so fantastic. And obviously I think, you know, what you saw and what you sort of gravitated towards, even with a child with autism is what I'm talking about with all kids. They, Mm -hmm. the quirky things that they are drawn to, you know, whether it's writing a book or doing something a little wackier, like loving coat hangers or, you know, just some strange thing that you're drawn to can end up there's, you would never like, you couldn't go to an after school program in coat hangers. Right. And so the idea that you were or bees even. So the idea that like we can always expose kids to what's going to fascinate them. I mean, I'd say expose them to a lot, but the chances that your kids after school program is exactly what really turns them on and really gets them interested is slim. There's a a teacher I love who's out on Long Island. Um, Actually, now he's an assistant principal. And during covid. His son started, he was always Googling things and then he would sneak his phone into the bathroom and the parents were mad. It's like, you know, what are you doing? You know, you're not supposed (laughs) to be on your phone all the time and this is bad. And what he was doing was researching cars because he wanted to start a car blog. He was obsessed with how bad the Saturn is and I have no idea why and I hope they don't sponsor your show. But um, (laughs) but that's like, who would know that like, well, what my son really wants to do is a car, oh no, a car podcast. And so he was, doing all the stuff that we want our kids to do, but we want them to do it about the American revolution or right. about, uh, you know, the, the, the K mutiny. We don't want them researching cars. We want them researching whatever is supposed to be doing for school, but he was learning. He was reading, he was writing, he was creating, he was producing, he was planning. I mean, all these functionings, these, these fantastic skills because he was so turned on. Right. And I don't think he was so turned on by his normal activities that he would have had if COVID hadn't hit and he didn't have all this free time. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Listeners of our podcast know we are huge fans of the Jordan Harbinger show here. If you're looking for another podcast with lots of random guests, interesting people who you never really know who you're going to hear from, might I suggest the Jordan Harbinger show? Each episode is a conversation with a different fascinating guest, and when I say there's something for everyone here, I really mean that. In one episode, Jordan talks to a hostage negotiator from the FBI who offers techniques on how to get people to like and trust you, which sounds useful and disturbing at the same time. He's also sat down with just so many luminaries of our time, Malcolm Gladwell, Kobe Bryant, Ray Dalio, Mark Cuban, Matthew McConaughey, Dennis Rodman, so many interesting people you've never heard of and so many big names. 
We really enjoy this show and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You remind me of many things when you're talking. It reminds me of Tony Robbins, weirdly, who oh, what, one <laughs> I always thing, remind people of Tony. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that he said that really stuck out to me when I was I was like for very first exposed to him and somebody left like that it was neighbors and they left like a series of his. I mean, they were cassette tapes. That this is how long ago this okay. was. <laughs> and it was one of his like programs or whatever. But I, I was probably like 19 or I was new in L.A., and I was trying to find my own footing creatively, but I remember him saying in one of his lectures, like, go where the juice is. Yes. Always go where the juice is. And I still think of that to this day where if I'm doing something and I'm like, eh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this just doesn't feel like there's much because he's like, that's where you'll get that energy to sustain right. you when it gets hard as if it's something that really like juices you up. And you see this with kids and then because I was always in like these alternative worlds that I fell into working with kids with autism. And then I kind of became weirdly like a life coach of young (laughs) teenagers or like young adults. That does not seem weird to me at all either. Can we just go back to your childhood again? You watched (laughs) over four other children. You felt like you took a wrong turn and then you got back and maybe you could help these other kids. That doesn't seem weird at all. Yeah. And they, I ended up working at one of the fusion academies. Are you familiar with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're very expensive one-on-one learning schools and it was insanely expensive in LA. I don't know what they are in other places. I actually think there is one out in like Long Island that my friend was just telling me about, but it doesn't sound as expensive as the one here. And they would have, this is kind of, it was like a weird catch-all place for kids who had not really thrived in place like Crossroads, which is a weird place where you go if you can't kind of function in like a very expensive private school or a public school. <laughs> I need a more expensive private school. So you need a more expensive <laughs> private school, with, but it's more creative and more driven to these kids who have I'm like... I'm sure it's great, probably. It works for a lot of kids, but the fusion seemed kind of like this last stop. Mm -hmm. Um, but the teachers were amazing because they could do these one-on-one things. So they had these projects that were so engaging to the kids. I mean, I remember one teacher had all the kids building Facebook pages for, um, like revolutionary war. It was like, yeah, heroes are the main players and everybody Uh had to choose one and then then they all had to interact on Facebook. Wow. I don't I think you could it. even do this anymore because Facebook now it's like you have to be an actual person, but it was so cool. Like the kids were so into it. They were so mm-hmm. into this. And it was a way to just kind of, I mean, even with like Duolingo, which at first I was like, I don't know. And now they've gamified it and I'm competitive and I'm like, these mother effers think they're going to get up, to, like beat me on and get up to number two. And wow. so they, because they've gamified it, right. I, I told my husband, I'm like, I don't even think I'm learning anything. <laughs> Not really. I'm just <laughs> slaughtering the competition, which is really all that matters. But right. he's like, I think that you are probably learning something, but it's like by in the way that you would absorb some information instead of right accidentally. Right. Yeah. Like they're tricking you into learning it. Um, wow. By like Wait. osmosis. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. So so I have an essay that's sitting actually on the desk of the LA Times up at page editor, if she's listening, that hasn't been published yet. And thinking about gamification, because gamification is a way to make something that would be difficult, so fun mm-hmm. that you do it, right? Almost despite yourself, because you're enjoying it as opposed to slogging. And I just want to talk about sort of the other side of let grow. It's not just about independence, about giving kids more independence, but it's also about giving them a chance for free play. And by free play, I mean the stuff you were talking about before, mixed ages, you and your cousins or you and your playmates, all different ages, doing what you felt like, coming up with an idea, and that's not fun and changing it and, you know, screaming about whether it was fair or whether the ball was in or out. (laughs) And so the, the, the op-ed that should be published someday is about how Mother Nature gamified all the social emotional skills that we're going to need as adults. Why do we have a oh, play wow. drive, right? You have the drive to play so that you will be willing to, like if you and your sister were you know, playing 
TV reporter or whatever, one of you has to be not the reporter. One of you has to be the cameraman for a right. while, right? So you have to learn to take turns. Yeah, You have to yeah. learn to be patient. You have to learn that like you've been taking, you've been doing it so long that it's her turn because you see that she's getting bored and might leave. And so you're reading her, right? Which starts these the, the development of kind of empathy. And if yeah. you're playing something with the youngest brother or sister, you throw the ball gently to them because- what's the point of striking out your six-year-old, right? When you're, when you're 12, right? right? I mean, you're not an asshole, right? And so that's the beginnings of empathy. And then the six-year-old is so excited that somebody 12 is playing with him that instead of, you know, tantruming when he doesn't get his way, he'll hold it together because then he gets to keep playing. And so that's the beginning of executive function. And so- All And the creativity that's involved. And then you come up with an idea and you have to explain it. And that's communication and you're getting buy-in. And all that stuff happens when you have all these ages trying to come up with something fun to do. And all of it doesn't happen or much less of it happens if you have an adult saying, okay, today we're playing this. These are the teams. You're batting first. You're bringing the snack. And now the game is over. Yeah. So, So what we try to get, and because I don't see kids doing this a lot anymore in parks, or just after school on the cul-de-sac, some places they still do. But a lot of people tell me that in their neighborhoods, even if they grew up in that neighborhood and used to be part of a gang that played outside, you know, knock on the door, can Betsy come out and play? They don't see it. So so we suggest that schools have what we call the Lecro Play Club because we're branding things, even though everything's free. And that is where the school stays open before or after school for mixed age no devices, loose parts, you know, the cardboard boxes and and balls and jump ropes, chalk, free play. And then the teachers are instructed to say exactly what your aunt used to say, which is like, you know, that's a kid problem. You can figure it out. Exactly. Thank you for letting me know. That's a kid problem. You can figure it out so that the kids get used to even solving their arguments because if an adult is always doing that, you know, the, the reason John Haidt came to me was that he was worried that kids on campus were feeling you know, insulted and fragile and hurt and unsafe when they were simply uncomfortable and unused to dealing with these feelings because there had always been an adult mediator until now. I've seen this even in like my community of adults online, <laughs> like I, I, because I have to do the mediation for fantasy.com yeah. and that people report each other when they're getting in arguments. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> you're yeah. adults here. Like, can't you can't you work this out yourself? Right, right, right. That's an adult like, problem. Let it go. Yeah, like, <laughs> like this is a kid problem, guys. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I think of the mantra I probably heard the most as I've been talking to you was "Go play." Like go we play. used to hear that incessantly. It would drive <laughs> us crazy because we'd be like, "What?" Well, it's you know, like go play. Go. Right. Yeah. We don't know what to do. Go figure it out. Go play. Like th- that was the directive. But you know what, what they were really saying, I mean, like in psychological terms is go find some intrinsic motivation to do something that you find interesting. And along the way, you may find your calling. Goodbye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have you read the book um, Mediated? No, what's that? It's he he wrote this in like 2005 and he was just so far ahead of his time. Thomas Day Zangotita. I Talk about it it obsessively, but he has this whole concept of just what he calls Justin's helmet principle. And he has what Justin's helmet principle. And he talks about the cult of the child. He devotes an entire chapter to the cult of the child and talks about um, how we kind of got here. But Mm -hmm. Justin's helmet principle, and I'm going to butcher it and I can't, I'll try and find it. But he, Mm -hmm. he basically says when he was a kid, he didn't have to wear a helmet riding his bike (laughs) now he's grown up and they know all this stuff about brain injuries and all the kids wear helmets so why wouldn't you want to try and protect your child and make them wear a helmet while they're riding a bike but it keeps going (laughs) so it just it keeps extending and um it's so good. I think about I think about this book. So all what the do you time. call is it is the word you keep saying Justin? Justin's helmet? his son, basically. Oh, Justin's so helmet. Like, so yeah, okay. <clears throat> he That's named it. Right for him. So on you know, when I started my blog, I said I believe in, you know, like I I'm not a daredevil and I believe in things like, you know, helmets and mouth guards and stuff. But somebody once pointed out, I was at a bike conference, that you know, helmets, I do love helmets. But I hate the fact that it's rewritten a bike ride into sort of made it like a motorcycle ride. 
Mm-hmm. Like it's something so grown up and so scary and so potentially dangerous that you'd better always have special equipment with you. And I, you know, I don't think kids are biking around as much. And part of it is like you go someplace and then you have your bike and your helmet or you, you start, you want to go someplace, but you got to find your helmet. And I, I don't want kids to get brain injuries, but I also want them to be masters of their world. And if you keep saying, wait, 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 watch out, that's dangerous. Stop. Have you thought about this? You know, suit up. It changes childhood. And my, my worry of the week, because I always worry about new things, <laughs> is that even taking like when I take my phone with me in the morning, I go to a park nearby here and exercise and I take my phone. And I'm like, why? And it's like, well, just right. in case, say my kids want to get in touch with me, say something happens to me. And so just by the fact that I have the phone, I've rewritten a walk to the park as a potentially catastrophic event. Right. And if I didn't have the phone, I wouldn't be thinking that way. And that's why when we started this conversation, we were talking about, you know, your baby and monitoring it internally and then soon to be monitored in its bed, probably is you've, you know, you've even rewritten, not you, but society has even rewritten the time that the child is asleep in their crib, you know safe delivery, you know, healthy baby passed its APGAR test and it's home asleep. Even that is not safe because why would you be monitoring it if it was safe? And so everything gets rewritten as dangerous when you have the ability to monitor it. Right. Exactly. I think this is essentially like Justin's helmet principle in a nutshell, what you're describing. Mm -hmm. Here's another example. And Mm -hmm. this is not the same at all. But okay. it's it, it it's another example of an area where I'm kind of like with the booster, for example, I'm lucky they're very much like, get the booster, get the booster, get the booster, get the mm-hmm. booster if you're a pregnant woman. And mm-hmm. I've heard from it's like 70 percent of pregnant women are kind of like, eh, I'll wait it out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I think a lot of women are choosing to just be like, oh, I'll just wait and see. And I've had friends who have gotten it at like 38 weeks because they felt like if something went awry, the baby could still come out. And also the baby would have some protection because they're saying that it gets past the immunity gets passed on to the baby. And so again, you're left as an adult trying to make this decision where you're like, am I doing my kid a disservice by not Mm. getting this? Mm. And already today I was reading about a new booster that's coming out in the fall that has like Omicron and the new one. So now with added Omicron. <laughs> yeah, now with added Omicron resistance. And so right. and cherry um, flavored <laughs> in gummy form. And, and so it's I think like as parents, I see these parents and I've talked to a lot of the parents in my neighborhood now too. And I see them kind of wrestling with and it's something I was talking to my therapist about, even with the kicking thing, where <laughs> I don't think women thought there was something they could do if there was lack of fetal movement. So I went from first trimester, cross your fingers, hope it sticks. Second trimester, hope she's okay down there, but I have no Mm -hmm. control over this other than what I put in my body and, you know, that's it. And third trimester, suddenly at 28 weeks, they're like, oh, but now if you notice diminished fetal activity, you know, you need to like go to your call your doctor or go to the as if they're now suddenly like there's something I can do, which is and I think it's untrue, nerve wracking. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So it is nerve wracking. And once again, we're back to one of the themes of this conversation, which is the idea of control. And it's, uh, I mean, I'm glad you didn't read what to expect when you're expecting. Cause I, I just opened pages and I get frustrated because it's always like, there's this optimal thing to do. And if you never ha- ate like one bite of bologna or one potato chip for nine months, you know, then you're fine, but you ate that sandwich, you know, or you ate a hot dog and, you know, nitrates are coursing through that kid and, you know, <laughs> you know, the slow class for him forever. And I, I was it, like, oh, you're not supposed to eat brie cheese like month six of my yeah. pregnancy. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, how, do those, how is there anyone alive in France? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, that's the other thing, too. Sometimes we just need some perspective. I mean, like like seeing that Borneo kid at three and a half being able to swim, seeing that all of France, you know, the kids are alive and the parents ate you know, brie and probably uh, smoke you know, their chitanes <laughs> or however you pronounce them, you know, for 
for nine months straight, my mom smoked a pack of cigarettes with me. I mean, it's the difference between the idea that you can do something that's better. Okay, I'm glad you're not taking drugs um, while you're pregnant. I think that's a really good idea. But the idea that there's there's such a big difference between just like being a normal person or be eating only organic beets for nine months is seems to me untrue. And the and the opposite is really the thing that drives us crazy because the what to expect book in version like three or something like that had a sentence that I hated, which was like, if you eat correctly and by correctly, they said each forkful, right? Not every day, not every month you should have, you know, a a healthy milkshake or whatever. It was like each forkful was right. There was better chance for better brain development, birth weight, lower chance for (laughs) birth defects. And it was like saying, so either you do everything right and you'll have an okay kid, or if your kid has any problems, it's because of you and your lack of willpower. Right, right. I just wrote about this in my geriatric mommy blog, um, Magical Thinking in the Dear Mommy. Dear Diary. Yeah. I've read. <laughs> Dear Diary. No, but it's like the, there's so much magical thinking in the mommy sphere too, mm. where, you know, m- it's tragical like, thinking. Call it tragical thinking, because that's what they keep thinking, that like you can prevent all tragedies if you are perfect, if you never blink, if you have every monitor, if you have every test, if you eat every forkful correctly. But the magical thinking is a rampant, too, where it's like if you don't say your mantras, if you worry, <laughs> if you even worry, worry, oh, my God, you're going to like you're going to manifest something bad happening to your kid, which is it's like, such a tautology ahead. because anything there's going to be something imperfect about your child and something magical about your child. And either way, it's like, well, see, it's because, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like, you know, you're a Sagittarius. So your child will be wildly rambunctious, but sometimes sad. It's like, that's so true. Yeah. 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 And I think that the putting that, like my therapist and I were talking, she's like, this is, it's like my own superstition that I had of, I'm like, I don't want to buy anything. I was afraid to like hold a baby, a a, like, (laughs) A, a baby item because mm-hmm. I thought I would jinx myself or something. Right. I didn't and, have a baby shower before my baby. Same yeah. Thing. Yeah. I think. And I think she's like, it's normal, but it's also a way for you to a try and mitigate disappointment, which by the way is going to be true, whether you feel like try and not jinx yourself or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're she was like, you're going to rob yourself of the experience of of kind of enjoying this. If you're just mm-hmm. constantly worrying that you enjoying it is going to jinx it, which is crazy. She <laughs> so also, you worrying is going to jinx it and enjoying it. Is yeah, jinx it. just just want you to know. She reminds me, though, that that's like she's like, that's trauma. You know, she's like that feeling like the rug is going to get pulled under you. Some of that is like my things that happen later. But she also was saying just the. The idea that like, yes, you can have mantras that help you self-soothe. You can have mantras that help you get through birth and labor and all these things that give you strength. That's when I recommend drugs. (laughs) (laughs) And she's like, but at the end of the day, it Mm -hmm. really is about you trying to control something that's totally out of your control. And again, we come back to control. I love your therapist. She's Um, from she's Nordic. That's why she's amazing. Oh. Nordic, I feel like they wouldn't have anything in common me whatsoever. They'd be tall and blonde and calm and, you know, know how to. She's very like kind of hippie, though, too, in a weird way. So she has like the right mix for me where she's Mm -hmm. like extremely practical, constantly learning more about the brain. She's always tall and blonde (laughs) and gorgeous and um, very not getting a great tan. she's, (laughs) She's not necessarily like orthodox in the way that she's she'll be like no that's a horrible idea you know most therapists will be like well what do you think about that she's like no you're not doing that's so stupid (laughs) you know finger down throat and so so so, but she's also like what sign is he (laughs) oh wow yeah all right she's hilarious Um, but she's right and we're all i mean like why are there superstitions i mean humans really do crave control and to a certain extent you know, like when you were talking about the parents trying to decide if their moms trying to decide if they should have the booster or not. And should it be at 28 weeks or 32 weeks? And is it too soon for the placenta? Is it too late for the immunity? I mean, we're given all this information and we're told that this, the key to control now is more information. And actually 
that drives you crazy too, because mm-hmm. I just read, you shouldn't get a booster. I mean, I'm making this up, you know, right. don't get a booster. It's terrible for their brain development. Oh, you got to get a booster. Cause what if they come out and they touch the inside of the vagina and there's a COVID germ there. <laughs> right. You know, so the old fashioned superstitions strike me as better, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're, sort of one, they're, 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 they're more multi-purpose. It's like God will provide or the Lord works in mysterious ways, right. or fate is fickle. <laughs> and if you believe in something sort of bigger than yourself, deciding what's going on, and it could be just fate, which seems, you know, which at least is is random, but it's still bigger than you, then you can breathe a little bit because otherwise you should be up till, you know, one in the morning reading the latest scientific journal on, you know, the mutations of blah, blah, blah gene uh, when exposed to the booster, Pfizer, this or that. And and we don't right. know that much stuff. And to try to, to, to have to think that you have to like have a, a chemistry degree and a biology degree and be a, you know, psychiatrist and a, a pediatrician before you can even birth a child is belied by the rest of the world that isn't doing that and has never done that through the history of humanity. Right, exactly. And this all seems to really culminate around parenthood, you know, parenting, yes. parenting, yes. Yes. this yes. thing yes. that's now a thing. It's yeah. like you used to just be a parent and now right. it's like a have been You used verbed. to just have kids. I mean, my yeah. friend Nancy, yeah, no, Nancy McDermott, my friend, explained that, you know, kids just came along when you were married or mm-hmm. even when you were unmarried. Imagine that. But now we plan for them. And so they are you know, it's, there's something else you have, you have created this as opposed to once again, fate or God or whatever, stepping in and saying, here's your kid, (laughs) you know, right. A lot of this too. And why I think you'll love this book mediated Mm -hmm. is about how, because we live in this self-reflexive world where everything is, is flattering us constantly because of all of the media constantly like you're personalizing everything oh wow and it's it's like these children are being raised to be in a world that's constantly flattering them because um that's so interesting some of this stuff comes with just the mediation of everything everything i mean i went down like the rabbit hole sometimes i just like to see like i went down the I'll do a random mommy hashtag on Instagram. And it was like doula life or something like that. (laughs) Uh (laughs) And everything has been mediated. It's true. Every aspect of this, the placenta, like there's placenta art, there's placenta smoothies. There's, Mm, I love it. Mm. (laughs) I just had one. (laughs) It's so nuts. And so he really ties it into just how more than ever before we're living in a different time where moms are like the mommy blog atmosphere, like the moms of Instagram, they're they're more concerned with like appearing as a mom than maybe being present as a mom. (laughs) It's Uh, like they're they're showing up as a mom. And it's so much pressure. The pressure, I, I see it so much. Like I really understand I hated school. I was so bored. I loved Mm -hmm. school. I was great at it. I thrived at it. But at a certain point, probably after my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Hungerford, who was the best teacher I ever had. And all downhill from there. He was so great. He had a whole like festival where he had to make up games and everybody and they were all educational games that we had to make up. And Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember it all so vividly because he was such a great teacher. We read, um, talk everlasting and talked about Uh what it would be like to live forever and like all these philosophical concepts. And I was in fifth grade. This was like, it was, he was amazing. And then it was kind of all downhill from there. And part of the reason I dropped out of college is because I, I felt like I just gotten out of jail and why now was I paying for this? (laughs) And I really was, my husband works with teenagers and doing what therapy. And so he works with addicts and teens (laughs) God bless him. And, Mm -hmm. and he comes home some nights and he's like, I have to remind myself, this is not all teens, but he's like, I'm like, we're taking her and we're, we're traveling the world from 12 to 15. Like (laughs) that's going to be your education. (laughs) So what I heard, and this could be wrong, is that in like medieval England, which I think was like a thousand years, uh, the practice was that when your kid hit, I'd say puberty, but maybe teenhood, Everybody traded (laughs) like you said, your team. Yeah, because 
you knew that like your kid was going to roll his eyes at you or her eyes and, you know, and there was going to be all these fraught relationships. Whereas if you have somebody else living in your home, they're a little more deferential. You're a little less upset when they are, you know, suboptimal behaviors because it's not your kid who's running his life. It's this other kid. And I could understand, uh, you know, traveling the world or giving them away. I mean, and, and the other thing is give them responsibility. That seems to be so key. It's, it's the age when they would normally be, you know, having kids and becoming adults themselves in much of human history. And we treat them still like they're 12 year olds, you know, or two year olds and watch them. And of course, we're tracking them. And, you know, I didn't even do this enough, like give them, you know, stuff that makes them not that makes them feel important. That actually is important. Things right. that, that help your household or help other people. And I think that's a great way to stop, you know, some of the feelings of uselessness or being babied. Because nobody wants to be babied, especially when you're ready to be, you know, a full human being. So, yeah. And there's there's so much of this weird paradox of like entitlement and being infantilized that's mm-hmm. happened. And it's like the the worst combination, you know, it just it doesn't seem great. These yeah. kids live in like a perpetual big brother nanny state. You know, they're like you were oh, saying yeah. that constant. It is just a a constant monitoring. And then I see it a lot. And Jonathan and I talked about this too, the constant appeals to authority, even appealing to like daddy government to fix things, appealing Mm -hmm. to the higher education, the teachers to fix, you know, disagreements, people that these people are having. And everybody seems to be appealing to, to something, some kind of authority. Right, right. That's what we were talking about before with the kids sort of waiting, operating instructions for yeah. micromanagement. So John and I wrote a piece called uh, The Fragile Generation. It was in Reason Magazine several years ago at this point. But I got to quote from my very favorite Parents Magazine article that I think explains why I don't blame parent. I blame Parents Magazine, but I don't blame parents because right. they read this magazine and they get terrible advice like this. The question was, it was about play dates. And the question was, uh, your kid is old enough to stay home alone now and often does, but now she has a play date over. Can you can you run to the dry cleaners? And of course, Parents Magazine said, absolutely not, um, because <laughs> uh, they gave an example of once a friend, you know, some kid had had a friend over and they microwaved macaroni and somebody got burned, which seems like what kind of idiot gets burned by macaroni, but somebody did. And then the other example they gave is, and what if there's an argument? You want to be able to jump in before anyone's feelings get too hurt. And so- When you have a magazine that you trust to be giving you good advice because you're trying to optimize your kid's experience and you're trying to be the expert and here the experts are quoted and they're telling you your kid is in constant danger of being physically harmed or emotionally harmed, even from a little spat with her friend about, you know, who gets to be in the cardboard box first, then you you've created a child that is expecting an adult to always be intervening and solving problems before they even before they have a chance to learn that skill on their own. And of course, if adults are always with kids, they will feel compelled to jump in because it's it's awful to listen to kids arguing and it's dumb to watch them ruining their play date when they could just take turns and you show them how. But in the meantime, you've deprived them of the opportunity to develop that skill on their own. So to expect kids to solve their problems and not turn to an adult when there's always been an adult there to solve their problems is silly, which is why let grow is our whole you know, when we boil down our our mission statement, there's a longer mission statement, but the really short one was when adults step back, kids step up. Mm. And how's it been going? Great. Oh my God, lately it's been really great. I'm talking to the Surgeon General wow. next Thursday about, you know, is there an easy way, free way to give kids back some independence and some, you know, uh, courage, I guess, and, and sense of joy too. And I think our two ideas, the let grow project where you go home and you do something new on your own without your parents, it works anywhere. If you're in a dangerous neighborhood, you walk down the hall to grandma's or you make dinner for your parents. And if you're in a safe neighborhood, you ride your bike around. And then the let grow project, I mean, sorry, the let grow play club where kids stay and play before or after school, which is as close as I can come to a normal childhood anywhere else in any other moment in history. I think just doing those two things would provide a, a great experience for kids playing. And then the experience that parents need, which is to see that their kid is okay without them constantly helping, without them constantly watching. Because 
you know, you're going to know from that, the fact that you're monitoring your fetus and you're going to be monitoring the kid in the crib. There's no moment that has been un, unmediated. Right. And so parents need the experience because that's what rewires you. Not listening to us talk about what's happened to parenthood, what happened to childhood. It's you need the experience of the joy of seeing your kid go off and run an errand, go off and actually play and come back sweaty and happy. And you weren't playing with them the whole time. That makes you so happy that it cancels out some of the fear because until then all you have, it's like anxiety. All you have is, Oh my God, it's not going to work. And then until you see it work and until you have that joy of like, I'm raising a blossoming child. And I, you know, there's not a lot of joy if all it is, is worry. I mean, you were talking about that before, you know, you want to be, you're you're pregnant, you know, this is amazing. Here you are 40 zillion years old and you have a baby growing inside you. And it's like, worry, worry, worry. Is it kicking enough? Am I doing enough? Should I get the booster? You know, what about the player? Should I touch another baby before that? It's like, you you want to have some fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think for the most part, because I have like great therapy and, Mm -hmm. um, I have my moments, but overall, I feel like it's been I've like loved being pregnant way more than I actually ever thought I would. Even it was never something that I was kind of like you. I was like babies, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I would look at just pregnant women. and I wasn't like, oh, I want to touch her and (laughs) look at like her, you know, like look at that miracle. I was kind of like, that looks horrible. Um, (laughs) 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 And now I do. I'm like, wow, uh, the more. You know, that's been interesting going to just kind of a we we signed up for this program, Maven, which was free with our health care because I can't the doulas are so expensive and everyone's like, you got to get a doula, you got to get a doula. And I was like, no, I don't know anyone who got a doula, but I come mm-hmm. from like a pretty working class family, mm-hmm. you know. And so we signed up for this free program that they just had uh, offered for like through our Blue Shield, their third party. And it's very like all around pregnancy, fertility The program is amazing. I'm actually so impressed with the program because they Mm -hmm. give you like a birth class and they have it with midwives and doulas. And so it's not because we took just the like birth class, the hospital hospital. Yeah. And they're they were so different. (laughs) So different. I'm glad I know the protocols, but, you, you know, there's definitely more of like an agenda with the hospital the hospital programs, like get they, it out, get it out, <laughs> yeah, get, get it out, and get her out, yeah, get her out of here. I can see why they're resistant to doulas, and <laughs> and so it was just fast. It's been fascinating to see it from all these different perspectives. And taking the infant CPR class, I was like, God, I'm never going to sleep again. But he infant was so ch- he was so chill, and he was talking about twice how he had to like you know save his daughters from choking at some point in their life. I was like, okay, see why you're doing these classes. Wow. But the the teacher, the teacher. Yeah. And what's he feeding his kids? Jeez. One was like, they were in Puerto Rico and the kid grabbed a a mint or something when they didn't notice. And they Mm. were in on a windy road and like the, they, they went over a bump and the kid had a mint and they didn't know it. And then he like saw, he had to like pull over and, oh my and God. another one was um like watermelon when they were learning how to eat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you All know, right. and should have been feeding them placenta smoothies. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah, it. it was just like fascinating to hear. And then I was, I was just sitting there listening to everybody's questions afterwards. And I'm like, hey, it's just, there were a lot of scary questions. I'm mm-hmm. glad I took it again. It's just kind of information that in the moment, I at least have something in my brain. That's like, don't go run for your phone first, <laughs> go, you know, like start CPR for a couple of minutes and then go find your phone. Just things that I don't right. know that I would. It also sounds like in teaching a CPR class, it doesn't sound like he ever used CPR. Sounds like he, you know, got the dislodged stuff from the throat. Right. right. So it's infant CPR and um, choking. So right. like the not the but just remember that, like, even even though you think you took it, you know, you did take a CPR class, it's still rarer than rare. I mean, I don't know anybody who's ever used infant CPR except maybe a fireman. Yeah. And I don't yeah. know any fireman. So I'm just assuming they use CPR. <laughs> yeah. Well, my brother's a fireman and I've never heard a story about him using infant CPR. So I'm not. All right. So I, yeah, just, I don't think that has to be like, oh my God, I forgot. Is it two compressions and then in the nose? <laughs> it's 30 now, by the way. 30. <laughs> and I know you're supposed to do it to stay alive. 
ha, ha, ha. Are you? Ha. Jesus, staying alive, that's dark. Staying alive. Staying alive. That's how fast you're supposed to do it. Oh, yeah. my God. Right. It's, it's, it's disco and life-saving. We live in a dystopia. Um, <laughs> a discopia. Well, uh, yeah, discopia. Right, right. It's funny. when the Bee Gees are in your brain. <laughs> and your baby is, is not right. responding. <laughs> right, that's exactly <laughs> I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Walk-ins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com and try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. So I'm going to ask the same two questions I asked. I could talk to you forever. We'll have you back on whenever you want to come on. You're welcome. And you want to switch them out with somebody in medieval England. I'm just, I mean, there's something to be said for boarding school too. A lot of these. Oh yeah. Just yeah. I just, I had dinner last night with this 21 year old who'd gone to boarding school. I was like, wow, you are so outrageously poised. Oh my God. She's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's definitely something to be said for it. If your kid doesn't get caught up with the wrong crowd and start doing drugs at Art Basel at 17 years old. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's that art basil boarding school that we've heard so much about <laughs> well it's the it's the rich it's the crowd kids. yeah right, right, right. it's the rich kids who 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 winter in you know right. south beach what's your biggest defect of character oh um let's see ruminating my biggest defect of character um a, a lack of optimism i guess hmm. would be it you know I mean, my husband has to remind me that most of the terrible things that we were about. See, I told you I'm helicopter up the wazoo. Don't happen. So it would be that. We worrying. Yeah. Ironically, it would be worrying. Do you think that Let Grow kind of was born out of trying to combat that own that helicopterishness and oh. within y- yourself? For sure. I mean, and there's stuff that I still I mean, I can't exercise. The fact that my sons are drivers now is drives me crazy. Yeah. You know, I am. I don't know how to ever get rid of the fear of my kids either hurting themselves or hurting somebody else in a car. Isn't that yeah. fun? What a what a drag of an ending, Bridget. Come on. No, my <laughs> sister. I mean, my sister's in this phase now, too, with her kids. And she's like, they get so annoyed because every time I'm like, be careful driving. It's scary. You it's know, terrifying. Like, Right. That whole quote of let it like a, yeah, like the, the heart walking around. It. It's worse when the heart is driving around. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> right, walking okay both <laughs> ways. Driving, oh my god. Yeah, they'll be fine. That's they'll they'll be fine. That's all they'll you can fine. do. Or you, or you're not in control. There was actually a like greater a greater plan. There was actually a Jordan Peterson clip that was going around recently where he was talking yeah. about like the greatest act of courage is a mother letting her child go out and how it's like you know, isn't the world dangerous? And he's like, no, it's more dangerous being here with me. And as much as I might, <laughs> that's think, what so many people think. Oh, Jordan <laughs> Peterson. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, as much as a lot of this stuff, I'm like, okay, Jordan, um, that one, I was like, oh, all right. And he was talking about the, I don't know. He's com- talking about like the, the Pieta and this, this, the kind of ultimate rep- representation of this. Uh, that's so interesting because I've been thinking about the Pieta and I swear I was thinking about it before Jordan Peterson. I'll send um, you this clip. That's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause it is the ultimate. It's like, Oh my God, she had a son who died. Yeah. You know, that's, yep. it's, it's a very compelling story. Apparently <laughs> <laughs> the most compelling um, story ever told. <laughs> well, we will end on a high note. What is your oh, biggest good. asset? My biggest asset? Um, podcasts. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, biggest asset is my husband. Really. I married well and he is so funny and, uh, he's the one who talks me down and, uh, he's just, he's just a good guy. Oh, I love yeah, that. Lucky. Yeah. 
I feel that way about my husband, actually. I always joke. I'm like, I didn't realize what a great husband you'd be when I married you. Really? You're <laughs> on a whim. <laughs> I mean, I mar- kind of married him. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know he was going to be so good at these other things that he's good at, mm-hmm, like just mm-hmm. being, uh, you know, pro- like putting things together for the house. I was going to say, and mine makes shelves. Yeah, you know, being handy. Not only wise and, you know, intuitive and funny, but makes shelves. Yeah, and so like sensitive and yeah, just... I didn't realize that I was, I was getting like a much bigger package. Than right, right, right. Getting. You would have paid more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's such a pleasure finally talking to you. Yeah, I, this was great. Yeah. I agree. Really I, fun talking to you. And I'm so excited about you being a mom and telling the world to just being honest. And then also having this weird perspective, which is skepticism about the culture that you're swimming in, even as you're swimming in it. <sighs> Even yeah, I mean, it's funny. You. We haven't even gotten to the like, you know, people are like, well, what are you going to all of it? I mean, people ask me questions. I'm like, I it's it always cracks me up when they ask me what my birth plan is. I'm like, for me, <laughs> for me and the baby out. to live. Like, yes, right, right, right. Very large, and you know what? For a lot of human history, that was like a big <laughs> hope that was going to be dashed. So yeah. I think that you have a lot of opportunity now for that to happen. <laughs> and that's all that really matters. Yeah, it really is all that matters. The The way it gets out is so to me immaterial. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think it's, you know, with my levels of worry, I'm not the person who's going to be like in a pool in the woods, <laughs> like staring at the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, and you yeah. have to have it at night. You know, like, you can't come out. Where's the moon? Wait, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you go blind? I was staring at the sun during my really, I go birth. <laughs> right, right, right. I knew I had to stare at some planet. <laughs> Got it wrong. Where can we find you and your program and your, all things? All oh, things. Thank you. Those of you who have listened to this point, please go to Let Grow, which is not. Let go, not let it go, not let it grow. It's L E T G R O W dot org. And we have my blog there. And we have, I mean, a blog there. I just edited it. And we have all the programs for schools, the Lecro Project, the Lecro Play Club. We have a Lecro Independence Kit if you just want to try it at home. But it's all basically encouraging people to trust their kids more and to not feel so, you're going to feel worried until you do it. Mm-hmm. And so you have to do it and then get less worried. It's it's too bad you have to put the cart before the horse, but you do. And so this is just ways to make it easier for you and, and a bunch of people to do it at the same time. This is so great. I love the work you're doing. I really think it's so important and increasingly more and more important. And I'm just grateful for you in the world. Ditto. Okay. All right. I would be high-fiving you, but of course you're like 3,000 miles away. (laughs) And of course, if I was your mom, I'd say, good job, Bridget. (laughs) High five. Good buddy. You're doing it, Bridge. Yes, that's right. (laughs) You're a badass. This is great. There's no check-in this week because I am on maternity leave. Check-ins will resume as soon as I feel up for it. My brain is working and I've exited somewhat the post-baby, first baby fog of what the heck just happened. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>